was a, a, a long time student and, and teacher of both sociology and psychology. He's written uh, a number of books over the years that have been, uh, I, I would say, extremely influential in terms of what might be called power elite or elite style analysis of how the uh, political system works in the, in the United States. As to say, we have in this country some people who believe that it's a consensus or there's no there are veto groups or whatever it is. It's not some belief that, that rules. Bill's books, Who Rules America, uh, this book, Fat Cats and Democrats, uh, Who Rules, Who Governs New Haven, Who Really Governs New Haven, uh, and so forth, have been very, very central works in this tradition. Uh, Professor Rothbard, I think, generally well known, even I'm going to introduce him as we can see here, so we can just slip him right in. But he's the author of most recently of The Ethics of Liberty, and also obviously of America's Great Depression, Manhattan and State, and so forth. I'm Bill Evers, I'm a graduate student of political science at Stanford, and I dabble in all sorts of questions, including this one. So I'm going to uh, say, say a few words later on. Why don't you okay. kick off? Thank you, Bill. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today, and it's a pleasure to know I'm on Bill, a panel with why do you not here sure? because I think they want to hear the They want to tape it? Because I'm, OK. I know he said that, but I was trying to get out of it. Is that OK? Am I set? Well, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, we go back a long way. And also with Murray, I'm glad to hear that Murray's going to be on the panel. Most recently, Murray wrote a review of somebody else's book in which he said it uh, was good, but that the person should have taken more account of some of my work. So. My biases are all in favor of Murray and, and much like his, needless to say. Well, I think to talk to, uh, to most of you about power brokers in California is like carrying coals to Newcastle or, in this day and age, like bringing chips to the Silicon Valley. Uh, what I will have to say, many of you probably um, already know and indeed may know more in detail than, than I do. Uh, I will probably say it only in a little different language language that maybe sounds a little too academic. So hopefully then I'll be um, fairly brief, and then we can get into discussion and, and questions. Uh, there was a day when I knew all these names. Uh, and as Bill pointed out, we listed the, them out in the back of the Bohemian Grove hardcover edition. But I received so much criticism from my fellow academics who said I was trying to pad the book that I called the publishers and I said, I don't need that kind of grief. Uh, take it out of the back of the book. I thought it was fun. I thought it was interesting. I also thought it would be fun to look these people up. Um, uh, but I got a lot, of, as I say, a lot of criticism, so we dropped it out of the paperback edition. The publisher didn't want to, but I felt embarrassed that nobody thought it was as fun as I did. At any rate, over the years, what has happened then is the names have gradually dropped out for me. And, but the process remains and the general structure remains. And I feel that the names are interchangeable and you can fill them in um, in any given era or epoch. Well, what I'm going to say today is that the powerful exist in networks. Networks, to use another fa fancy ner term, are often nested within e each other. The powerful in America, we can find them as interlocking overlappers, that is, the people that uh, are on a lot of different boards and in a lot of different organizations are invariably the people who are picked to be the most powerful uh, b uh, by a reputational method, that is, by asking uh, people in a position to know who is powerful. Hi, Murray. Hi. How you doing? Good, Good to see, see you again, pal. Good to see you. So they are, they are interlocking uh, overlappers. Uh, the people who are power brokers are people who uh, link networks together. They are not necessarily the most powerful people uh, in the given state or in the nation, but they are instead uh, the people that, that uh, uh, are the go-betweens, that articulate uh, the needs of the various parts of the network. When we talk about the most powerful, we're talking about, I believe, the people who stand at the center of the corporate networks in the state of California. And if we would look at the boards of directors of the major corporations in this state, as we have at various times over the last two decades, we'd find that these corporations are very tightly inter interlocked, 
in terms of sharing directors. And we'd find that at the center of these networks uh, are the major banks of Los Angeles and of uh, San Francisco. And when we look on the boards of these banks, we will then find the representatives of the major growers, the major manufacturers, the major retailers, and so on um, of the state. This corporate network then makes, uh, creates a corporate community. I, I at least like to call it the corporate uh, community. And this community not only consists of these corporations, but a variety of think tanks and discussion kind of, of organizations. The most prominent of which in California right now are uh, its Chamber of Commerce and its uh, California Roundtable, which is the state level equivalent of the National uh, Business Roundtable. And this corporate community, in turn, then relates to government. And it does so in a variety of ways. And I think it's important to uh, uh, understand that each one of these ways of linking to government in and itself is a little network or subsystem of the whole larger system. And that's why it's, it's necessary to have these go-betweens or power brokers within it. Each one of these subsystems does a little different uh, kind of a thing. We have, for instance, in California, as in the nation or in any other state, a whole complex special interest process by which specific corporations or specific industries uh, relate to government, wherein they set up their trade association, they hire a set of, of lobbyists and publicists, and these people then go and work very hard in Sacramento. These trade associations also give money to specific uh, candidates. They work very hard, in short, to look out for the narrow, short-run interests of their particular uh, sector of the larger uh, corporate community. And that process has been very much studied in the state of California, and the special interests are, uh, are well known uh, and very famous. Uh, and they work on you uh, day in and day out. I knew uh, in the 60s a man named Bill Stanton, who had been an economist at San Jose State, and had been elected to the legislature. And Stanton felt that he was going to just change things and he would be this dangerous radical. But as he said, that didn't bother the sin lobby, the liquor interest, the racing interest, all other special interests related to them. They would give him money no matter what. He said, but I'm against you on everything. They said, that's OK, Bill. You may come to change your mind. And they would give him money to be reelected, and so on, which would then bother him uh, no end that, uh, that he couldn't upset them. But their job is to stay in close, to make friends, to say, look, on one issue you might come to be with us uh, eventually. At the next level up, though, there is what I call a policy planning network. And this is the network through which the more general interests of the corporate community are uh, developed and articulated. It's at this level that the California Business Roundtable or the Chamber of Commerce uh, in general, that is not its various subcommittees, uh, would try to influence uh, the legislature or more particularly to reach uh, directly uh, to uh, the governor. The kinds of people involved in this process are more likely to be people that have been legitimated as experts, uh, often as academics, people who seem to be above the fray. They're not looking out for lumber. They're not grinding a special ax for uh, um, the, the agricultural interests. They're looking out for the economy as a whole. They're looking out for the state um, as a whole. They are attempt to be seen as nonpartisan or as bipartisan, as the case uh, may be. And then thirdly, we have a, a process, um, a whole complex network that links into the two political parties, which I call the candidate selection process, which means, which is what we mean by politics, but I use that different term for a very special reason, which is to emphasize that what we do through this process is not really politics in the wider sense, but the narrow sense of just filling the office. Uh, that we don't really go through much political education, we don't really go through much policy development, and we certainly don't have much party discipline um, in our political process. So the political process comes down to filling these offices, finding candidates that will end up serving in government. And that particular process is uh, related to by the corporate community in a way, again, that won't be surprising to you at all, and that is through campaign finance. And so we find that the people who are so central 
in the corporate networks are the people who are the important money raisers for uh, the two political uh, parties and for specific candidates uh, within uh, those parties. And very often, even for Northern California uh, candidates, they will go hat in hand to LA to what are called the big taps and ask if they might uh, uh, receive money uh, for their campaigns in Northern California. Those, I think, are the main ways in which uh, this corporate community uh, relates to a government here in California and, as I say, in the nation as a whole. Each has a little different function. Each has a little different set of people involved. And because it's complex, then there have to be people that serve this brokerage uh, kind of a function. Well, um, that kind of a static picture is what interests uh, sociologists, people interested in the uh, uh, distribution of power uh, in the United States. But more interesting to you, perhaps, is what they are doing. And I wanted to just say a brief word about that. I agree with uh, Fran Piven and Richard Cloward, uh, who at the national level say that currently uh, the powerful in the United States are in involved in a new class war. Uh, their major concern is to undercut the social programs that were developed uh, in the 1960s and the 1970s. They want to undercut those social programs because they provide, in effect, a social wage to uh, a great many people, which makes them then uh, more um, uh, resistant to cuts in their uh, individual wage. Uh, in short, in order to uh, have workers be willing to work for less, uh, to make America then more competitive in the international economy, uh, this new class war has been undertaken. It's undertaken by saying all those liberal social experiments failed, all those liberals that were sort of running amok with their ideas, trying this and that out, it all was really crazy kind of idea. Well, as a power analyst, I don't know whether they were crazy ideas or not. I, I'm just concerned about the fact, or I just analyze it in terms of the fact that I think they were not just ideas or adventures by liberals, but rather were the response to the great upheavals of the 60s and the early 70s and that this was the way of dealing with the disruption that was occurring in the system. Now that that disruption has gone away, meaning that most people are back in their routines, now we can brand all of those as liberal social experiments, wild ideas from the Ford Foundation and so on, when I think they were basically damage control uh, kinds of programs, which from the side of the poor were one, and from the side of the uh, of the corporate community could be seen as kinds of, of concessions. This particular, this class war is being fought in the name of ideas that are, I know, dear to your heart, namely uh, the idea that government should not be big or if it should exist at all, uh, it should do the very uh, bare minimum. In other words, it's a libertarian sounding uh, kind of program, but I do not think that the corporate community is libertarian, I think rather that they are very uh, pragmatic. And when there is disruption, they are social democrats. And when there's no disruption, then they're uh, libertarians. Uh, they do want spending cut in the state of California, but they were not eager and big backers of Proposition 13. It was not their idea, and only some of them got into it rather uh, hesitantly. And I would suggest to you in closing that uh, for them, the problem is that the state is needed. They do need the state. Uh, they need it to regulate themselves uh, and, and through regulating them, having regulatory agency partly legitimating themselves. Uh, they need the state for subsidies. Uh, they need the state, speaking generally, not the state of California, but a governmental uh, apparatus and the whole uh, system of government. Uh, they needed also to extend and defend their foreign markets and their need for uh, um, resources that are on other soil. For all those reasons, the state is needed by the uh, corporate community. But the state is also feared by the corporate community. It's feared by the corporate community because states can become, uh, they can get out of hand, they can become over-bureaucratic uh, and dangerous to the interests then of the 
powerful. But the state is also feared in America, I believe, f because of our specific uh, American heritage and history and ideas, and that is that the basic founding idea of the country is in the idea that power is rooted in the people, and there's always the fear then, or the danger, that the people may take over uh, the government. And I believe an analysis by a political scientist at, uh, at uh, Berkeley, uh, David Vogel, uh, wrote an article called Why Businessmen Mistrust Their State uh, in the United States. In terms of this populist kind of analysis, uh, uh, that the state may uh, come into the hands of the people. And so they join in the general denunciation of the state uh, out of that kind of fear, but at the same time caught in a situation where they do need it for a great many of uh, their purposes. So we are in that phase then in closing where the attack is on the social programs that prop up the uh, wages of, of the uh, working people and the poor, but at the same time uh, they are uh, uh, fearful that that kind of thing would go so far as to lead to uh, a general attack on the, uh, on the government. Um, let me stop at that point um, and uh, turn it over to Murray, and then we'll go to Bill and have a uh, question. Thank you. I got to give this to Murray. Yeah. They want to. They want to tape you. They want you for posterity. <laughs> How does this work? You got to just put it on anywhere. Okay. Put it right there. That's where I got it. There. There. Yep. He'll let you know if you're. If you're Not much. Put it on your collar. Oh. Okay. Got a little stiff the top of the one. Uh-huh. Collar? Collar ain't a lot more. Is that it? Oh, okay. Got it. That's it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let me tell you how I, how I got into this whole movement, so to speak. Uh, I was a little bit, I started as a libertarian economist and still am, and uh, recorded the, uh, the uh, record of, of uh, economic error and sin and so forth, and all the government, increase in government intervention over the last century. And uh, of course, the first thing you realize is that when you look at the situation is that how come so many businessmen or big businessmen are, are in favor of government intervention? Now, the, the standard argument when I was starting out, uh, which was also essentially the Randian argument, is that uh, big businessmen are filled with altruism, uh, inducted into altruism by their instructors or their culture, and they're, and they're corrupted by uh, left-wing teachers in their prep schools. And somehow it didn't seem to be a satisfying explanation, <laughs> okay? And it didn't seem to me that Nelson Rockefeller, for example, when he skyrocketed out of the political scene, was filled with altruism or guilt. It didn't, didn't look like it, right? It didn't seem like a guilty, uh, guilty uh, sort of craven type. He seemed out for power. So uh, the, the explanation wasn't very satisfying. As I looked into it and read the works of Professor Domhoff and Coco and others, the whole thing began to be illuminated, okay? There was, a, there was, a, there was an important missing ingredient to the explanation for the growth of statism in the 20th century. Namely, they're getting a lot of money out of it. Okay? Not all businessmen, but those who are in on the take, on the boodle. Uh, also in history, when you confront the sort of, uh, when you start dealing in this sort of explanation, there are two smear terms that, are, that people attack you with. One, that you're engaging in a conspiracy view of history, conspiracy theory of history. And two, that you believe in economic determinism. Okay? I don't believe in economic determinism. I just think it's an important influence as Robert Sharkey, the brilliant historian of the post-Civil War period, said at one time in his book, people are not determined by their, econ by their economic interests, but they very often act against them, against their economic interests. They don't, very often. they don't very often act against their economic interests. I think it's a useful way of putting it. It doesn't mean it can't happen, it's just not very likely. Okay. And uh, also, the, the historian, it seems to me, should ask the question, qui bono, for any particular event. All right. You start saying, okay, something happens in the world, whatever it is. Who benefited from it? Uh, that doesn't mean, of course, that just, just, just because somebody or some group benefits from something, that these people are therefore responsible for the action. That's, you see, the error that most conspiracy people have. Um, that's when you go, sort of go off the, tra the, the, the rails. If you don't check and find out whether these people are really responsible for the initial initiation of the action. Uh, the most extreme version of this, I think, was one by the, the crazed ex-reporter Douglas Reed, who, uh, Looking at World War II, he used to be a reporter from the London Times. Looking at World War II and a series of books, he said, look, who benefited from World War II? Well, the Germans lost, 
It was shattered. That was the you know, early part of the post-war period. And Israel benefited. Therefore, Hitler must have been a Zionist agent, consciously after the destroyed Germany. That, that sort of thinking, quote unquote, is, it gives conspiracy analysis a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what you have to do then is not only figure out who benefited from something, but also did these people, did the beneficiaries actually lobby for the particular action? Okay. If they did, then things begin to check out a little bit. I think it's, it's reasonable to say these people were therefore responsible for the, uh, for the action. Now, now, most people, almost everybody will agree on things like tariffs, okay? S there's a lobby for a steel tariff, let's say, or steel import quota. Everybody knows damn well that the people behind are the, are the steel, is, is the steel industry. I mean, there's no, there's, you're not accused of economic determinism or conspiracy theory if you say this, okay? For the tariff, it's crystal clear, <laughs> all right? It doesn't mean you can't have suckers who come who will get involved in this for for because for, for, they believe in protectionist philosophy, if you want to call it that. Just that the uh, it's pretty obvious the initiating force behind the tariff is the particular industry being benefited. Okay, um, but so if it's true of tariffs, why can't it be true of other things, other government, other acts of status intervention, which are not quite as crystal clear as a protective tariff? And sure enough, it works out that it's, it is true and has been true, and continues to be true. Uh, now it's important, I think, for this for various reasons to zero in on this because if we keep saying, "Well, gee, we are, we're here, we have us for educational uh, activities," we keep saying that such tariffs are bad, and somehow we can't convince everybody. We will never convince the steel industry. We might if the steel industry is really cracking up, like the railroads have finally been convinced after pushing for government intervention for a hundred years in such bad shape that now in favor of the free market. So it can happen. <laughs> okay. But the point is, it's very difficult if you have a people who are heavily involved in, in the industry living on protection, it's very difficult to talk them out of it by pure economic reasoning. And we have to realize that, okay, who are the forces behind this particular error? It's not just error, it's also economic interest. Two examples of this I think are interesting and you might not realize. One is the beloved and revered Marshall Plan, probably the most venerated plan since World War II. Uh, pushed by the establishment as being important for the reconstruction of Europe, has really launched the whole foreign aid program. This is really true of foreign aid in general. The Marshall Plan was the beginning of the post-war foreign aid program, ostensibly to reconstruct Europe. And most historians, when they deal with these things, the record of, say, foreign aid, will just deal with that. Who passed what legislation and what year and et cetera, et cetera. They don't deal with who launched it, who was behind it, and did they benefit from it. Okay. The Marshall Plan was put through of uh, the Congress, well, first of all, most, many Congressmen were against it. That was a period where it was still only non-interventionist uh, doctrine was still strong in Congress. It was pushed through by my mighty propaganda campaign launched by something called the Committee for a Hundred for a Thousand or a Hundred or Ten Thousand, whatever it was, for the Marshall Plan. They took out full page ads all across the country. If you look at the names of the people on the ads, all big shot businessmen, who were they? They weren't just businessmen. Each and every one of them were connected with export, American export industry, either as presidents of export firm or bankers for export firms. Okay? <clears throat> and why should that be? It is because the essence of foreign aid has nothing to do with reconstructing Europe or Asia or anything like that. The essence of foreign aid is, very, is quite simple. Uh, and it's still true, of course. Namely, the US taxpayer is socked, is moped at a huge amount of money. This money is then goes to the US government, which extracts a handling fee, quote unquote, of the little bureaucrats who live off the program. The rest of the money is shipped to some foreign dictator, it's almost always a dictator, okay, who then uh, uses it to build up his own power base versus his subjects, his, his the oppressed subjects. They then take the dollars. What do you do with dollars? The only thing you do with dollars is buy American products, okay, if you're a, whatever country you're in. <clears throat> Therefore, they then use most of the money after deducting their handling fee to buy American products from American export firms. <clears throat> So what you have, actually, in more technical, more detail, is that they take the money and then they take the goods that they buy, the government does, and it sells it to their own citizens and pockets the money that way. So what we have foreign aid is one gigantic racket by which the American taxpayer is the pays for, for pays for the following beneficiary. The losers of the American taxpayer are also, of course, the foreign country taxpayer because they lose visa via their own government. The losers are the American taxpayer, number one. Number two, whichever foreign country citizens, whichever country we're dealing with, it's country X. The gainers are the American bureaucrats, the foreign dictator, and 
the vast bulk of the American export firms who get the contracts. The Marshall Plan was put through not only by the, these export interests. The Under Secretary of State, Marshall, of course, was a figurehead. Didn't know anything about foreign policy or anything like that. The Under Secretary of State who who put through the Marshall Plan, and after the Marshall Plan was passed, resigned from, his, from the State Department, rejoined his own private, uh, private sector, was Under Secretary, Under Secretary of State Will Clayton, Willard L. Clayton, distinguished, quote, free market, unquote, businessman. Sponsored all sorts of free market institutes, spoke at free market uh, you know, associations. He put through the Marshall Plan. Okay? He then resigned from the Marshall Plan after his deed was done rejoined his firm, which was Anderson Clayton and Company, the world's largest cotton broker, which got a huge multi-million dollar contract from the Marshall Plan organization. Okay, that, to me, is a microcosm of government business relations and government intervention. You talk a free market game, <coughs> and then you engage in subsidies, contracts, monopoly privileges from the government. <coughs> a friend of mine used to work for, years ago, he was an economist, he used to work for us writing speeches for businessmen. They said, gee, those speeches are really great. They sound like great libertarian types, almost every one of them. Of course, the, actual, the policies are usually completely different. Uh, the other thing, I, mean, I just got through doing a lot of research on the origins of the Federal Reserve System, <clears throat> which again, we think of as a giant economic error <clears throat> brought about by incorrect banking theory. I'm sure incorrect banking theory is involved here, but the real essence of the Federal Reserve System is the work as a giant cartel scheme by which the Federal Reserve System acts like a cartel organizing the banks so they can all inflate together, <coughs> which of course is what the consequence has been. Uh, it was sold to the American public as a way by which the banks can, uh, banking action can be stabilized and the government will step in as big daddy and, and iron out the business cycle because private banks are too greedy and they tend to inflate too much. This was the general doctrine of sold to the public. The actual fact is precisely the opposite, precisely the opposite. Banks on their own can do, can do very little, because you have 10,000 banks, and one, one bank inflates, they're going to be sucked pretty quickly and go out of business by the other 999 banks. So you need a giant cartel organization run by the government called a central bank, which can pump reserves in and float, waft the whole system up together, inflate uniformly throughout the country, which is, of course, what they, they did. And the banks at the time who organized the Federal Reserve System put it through knew darn well that's what they wanted. They said it openly to their, themselves and their own associations. It just didn't go out to the general propaganda media. <clears throat> so they said the money supply is inelastic. We're suffering from inelasticity, which means the banks can't inflate enough. We therefore need some federal mechanism by which the banks can inflate. And that was the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System was written by big bankers, was planned by big bankers, and was organized and staffed by big bankers from, very, from its very inception. Okay, so when you look, when you see that record, it becomes pretty clear what the problem is. The enemy, so to speak, of libertarianism and the free market is not just incorrect ideas. It is incorrect ideas, of course, but it's also something else, namely a small, relatively small bunch of people who are ripping us off, us, off, us off, okay? Now, this also has a certain dramatic appeal. See, a lot of people tell me, Professor Rothbard, how can we carry our message to the public? We're libertarians. How can we encapsulate these things? In, if it's a complex theory, but we're engaged in moral theory, economic theory, political theory. How can we inflame the passions of the masses so they even get interested in this theory? And one of the answers is, they're ripping us off, damn it. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and we can point out how they do it. I think it's a very effective propaganda weapon as well as being tr true, and as well as filling in the picture of why statism has developed in the 20th century. Thank you. Yeah. Since I'm not on the program and sort of informally here, my remarks are going to be a bit sketchy and perhaps I may engage in some dialogue with our other two panelists here. But several things occurred to me here that I would like to hear some more thoughts on. One is the whole question of the cohesiveness and ability to work together of these people that are essentially ruling the American political system. You know, as, as Professor Rothbard mentioned in describing the banks, these guys are all in a lot of separate businesses and might look in the first instance as if they're going to automatically be rivals to each other. And yet, here they are. A lot of times, they're lobbying for the same program or they're working, supporting some particular policy institute. How is it that they get the grease, get the, they oil the, oil the thing so that 
they're not at each other's throats all the time. They're able to do a certain, some of them, the ones that have the will to dominate, are able to work together. What are some of the mechanisms for that? And I know Professor Domhoff has some thoughts on that. Okay, another thing it seems to me is that Professor Rothbard is making an extremely important point, and that is that it's, we, it is, people are interested in naming names, okay? Look at your newspaper. It's full of names. It's full of stories about who is doing what to whom, okay? We can, in our political work, essentially, we can essentially be described as trying to tell a story, okay? And that story is somebody is taking what's rightfully yours and they're doing a damn good job of it. And here's who they are and how they're doing it. So you need to think about how you can describe this. One way you can do this is by Professor Donhoff's books. Professor Rothbard's America's Great Depression has some of this stuff in it also. Uh, Gabriel Kolko's uh, book on the, tr the um, triumph of conservatism has a certain amount of this in it. Also his book on American foreign policy. Getting a, a lot of these things are beginning to get a little old. We need essentially a new generation of research. Don't, don't be upset, you know, you're going to find that many of these writers are socialists that you don't agree with, okay? First of all, a, par a part of that is jargon, okay? And Professor Domhoff doesn't agree with da Dan Smoot, okay? Uh, who, interestingly enough, I think went to high school with C. Wright Mills, a famous uh, academic sociologist of, of the same elite school. But anyway, and yet I think Professor Domhoff will tell you he can pick up stuff from what Smoot is saying. Sure, he wants to check up on it, you know. It's not, you don't automatically check out other people's research and so forth. But Dan Smoot and Bill Domhoff and Murray Rothbard, in fact, even though one is a, a kind of socialist, as, as Professor Domhoff is, and one is a libertarian, and Smoot, I guess, is some kind of bircher, they're actually dealing with the same empirical reality, okay? And so it's, it's, it's valid. You, you, you have to do this in your own community. If you're running for local office, somebody is running your city. Somebody is trying to run your city, okay? Same at the state level. People like, you know, Warren Christopher. Remember Warren Christopher who was involved in the negotiations to get the hostages out of Iran? There's a famous article that was written by Warren Hinkle in a now long defunct magazine called Scanlon about Warren Hinkle and the law firm that runs California. And he described, he said, you know, this man is the Cardinal Richelieu of California politics. Okay, and he described how he and the law firm of O'Melveny and Myers strove to influence both the Republican and Democratic policy how they were in the same law office and they saw each other and all this sort of thing. Actually, the Incredible Red Machine has some stuff like that. Okay, right. The, 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 the Susan Love Brown edition of the second, the one you've seen. The, no one even knows about the first edition of that book. Anyway, and that's, that's in a, that's the, the, the Incredible Bread Machine is in a popular form that's quickly assimilable. Some of the Colco books and so forth may, may take some more background and work to get to. Okay, another thing that's interesting is the example of urban renewal. Here is a, a case of a thing that's constantly sold as, oh, benefiting people, this is great, it's reconstruction of our destroyed core cities, right, slum clearance, and so forth, okay? Now, there's some, you know, there's some right-wing criticism of this. People are saying, you know, it's, it's really not economically sound, it's, it's if you read Martin Anderson, there's even questions raised about property rights. But there isn't that much out there in the conservative and free market literature about really who has put this through. How have these, you know, carrying a policy through like, that, like urban renewal that involves all sorts of dis governmental districts, incredible bureaucracy, elected officials, federal, state, local things, and so forth. That's complex stuff. People have to put this together. That's what has been studied. And there's a famous book called Who Governs, okay, about New Haven that says really 
There's no organized effort to put through a concerted, plugged in network that's trying to put through policy. It just happens. There are a lot of groups out there that balance each other. Professor Domhoff has actually looked into the reality of this, and I think he could share a little with us. The last thought I had is maybe Professor Rothbard or Professor Domhoff or I might have some thoughts about watching the California connection in the Reagan administration. This is a fascinating thing. Take a company like the Bechtel Corporation, OK? Here's a company. Now, you know, it, it's a company that has a long time interest in government activism. It's a construction company. It builds big things, dams, air, air, airports, military airports in Thailand. You know, that's the kind of thing that they have specialized. Job creating companies. Yes. <laughs> in fact, some of you may read in the paper, Ronald Reagan suddenly coming to the conclusion that all his attacks on make work jobs may have been an exaggeration. But he is responding to what he sees as the reality of power, not simply abstract arguments. Okay, So it's important. Libertarians believe as they do in many ways because of abstract arguments. But we have to realize there are other things, there are real people that hold abstract ideas or that refuse to accept them and, and go for meat and potatoes by some other route. And don't forget that the American Revolution, the revolution that created the political culture in which we're and, and a political culture, some of the original ideas of which libertarians certainly admire, was fought by pointing out that there was a, a conspiracy to take power, that there was, that, you know, the, the government in England was taking away rights of people, naming names. If anybody who goes back and reads those original pamphlets can see that saying who is doing what to whom was an incredibly important ingredient in mobilizing popular sentiment. So I've thrown out a bunch of ideas that could consume 10 hours worth of stuff, but I thought I would raise some of them and perhaps we can hear some more comments. I think we should stay seated here and just yeah. I think maybe, that's maybe the people want to respond to that question. Yeah. Might be some. That will have some questions and answers. Yeah, because I don't think I could uh, elaborate much on what Bill has said. I find myself nodding or in agreement, and I don't know whether time is exactly right now to get into urban renewal. Although, if that comes up in questions, that's fine. So maybe if Les Murray has something further to say, we could why don't get we your ideas questions? and responses. Yeah. Well, I don't know as much as you do about this. It's all very new to me, and you've tantalized me so very much that it's going to take some more investigation. But a few quick questions that come out. What, one, what about the other power centers, the unions, the, the teachers' organizations? Those aren't um, <coughs> companies in, the, in, the, in that sense. And they're not capitalists in that, in right. that sense. Um, how do these groups, how do they see the system? If you see it as a network, don't some of them see it as a network and are consciously working in that network and making it more of a conspiracy than, than just happening the way Joel said? No. I think the unions see it the same way. You can see you can see the Teamsters Union or the UAW. And they're plugged into different. They're they're each picking some different kind of network. You know, the construction union will pick its route, and the auto workers will pick its route. They're each trying to plug into what they see the most effective power system for them. There's also a common sharing of interest between Bechtel Corporation and the, and the, and the construction workers, right? Right. <laughs> So that, that's where the, yeah. Or the ICC yeah, bureaucrat sure. and the Teamster right. versus the independent trucker. All right. this stuff is very important. Right. Right. Uh, how about the Craig in the back? Your theory is correct. Speak up. Speak, speak up. up. There's a lot of noise here on this. If your theory is correct, couldn't these powerful corporations make more money by, for example, abolishing the corporate income tax instead of getting special subsidies for their industries? Why don't they go after that? I think the answer. I think the answer to that is that when you say that there is a a dominant, as I do, corporate community in the United States, and that it's relatively cohesive and can come together real well when it's highly threatened or on a highly important general issue. After you've said all that, you don't deny that you don't say that everyone else is totally powerless if they are uh, organized. And for instance, the teachers have been in certain states or in certain cities, such as New York, for a time when organized and in a time of expansion of education, they were fairly powerful. 
uh, uh, certain kinds of issues uh, for a while. And I think there have been times and circumstances in which the power of, of the corporate community has been somewhat circumscribed. But having said all that, it's still the case, the kind of thing that Murray and I have been saying on them having needed money for various kinds of things. And the corporate income tax, or the taking of money, corporate tax, not an income tax, um, they had to fight World War II. And the corporate taxes got to be very important at that time period. And, and then have gradually been whittled away down, down over the years. But they were certainly fought against being whittled down by the, um, by the opponents of corporations. I'll put that very generally. But the way the corporations reacted then was to get all sorts of complex special breaks. That is not a general abolishment of the taxes, yeah. but there's a depletion allowance here and a special privilege yeah. here and so on. That, right. But that shows the play of power, it seems to me, within yeah. the system. Well, so I can't prove this for the corporate income tax, but many of these situations, which looks like a left-wing, quote-unquote, anti-business thing, is really put in by big corporations to screw the small competitors. For example, the workman's compensation laws uh, in the progressive period. These add tremendous fixed costs to the small businesses. Large businesses don't really care. They can have an apartment filling out forms and all that. You wind up then by especially uh, burdening small business competitors, especially new ones that are trying to break into this cartelized system. Uh, same way with the income tax. The income tax, as Mises pointed out many years ago, injures the rising entrepreneur, the one who wants to, wants to make money fast and reinvest it and so forth. Rockefeller doesn't really care much about the income tax. They've got billions already. So there's, no, there's no tax on wealth, as there shouldn't be. But the point is, what you're doing then is, with the income tax, you're punishing those who are rising up to try to compete with the already existing uh, wealth structures. So a lot of these things, I think, work out that way. But we have to yeah. study it. I mean, it's yeah. an empirical oh, yeah. question. It's an empirical okay. question. It's Absolutely. not it's all the same. There, there's also, I just want to just add, the, the Irving Crystal people were talking about the new class, I think, also works here, too. There's a lot of, there's the class pressure, so to speak, from, the, from technocrats, uh, planners, intellectuals who want to plan the system. And, uh, and they're also, they're another group that's, that's in there lobbying for this particular thing. There's a the famous phrase that the only people, the only poverty that was cured by Lyndon Johnson's war against poverty was the poverty of the bureaucrats running, this, running the organization. <laughs> okay. Murray, was there any uh, uh, coincidence behind the, the 1913 being the year of the formation of the Federal Reserve System and the uh, income tax? Uh, yeah, well, the, 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 that was the culmination of the progressive system, the progressive so-called progressive system. Did they vote system. after 1930? Uh, well, the, the income tax amendment was passed a little bit before that. They both, oh. they both happened, the actual tax, right? There was a Federal Trade Commission yes, about that Federal time. Federal Trade Commission. Clayton Act. Clayton Act, the whole damn thing really comes in. Interestingly enough, the statement, the, phrases, the, off, the phrase often used then was, we need the Federal Trade Commission to do for general business what the ICC did for the railroads, what the Federal Reserve did for the bankers, what the agriculture program does for the farmers, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, consciously integrating them into this cartelized kind of system. And uh, that, 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 that they, they said it at the time that people were actually doing it said it, and I think it's true. It was the, That's why it's so important yeah. to study these general yeah. policy organizations of the corporate community, because you can see them yeah. over a long yeah. period of time learning how to best deal with their problems. And as Murray said, they learned about regulation through the experience yeah. of, the, of the Interstate Commerce Commission. Mm -hmm. They realized regulation could be useful right. for other things. And they saw it sometime, not just that it was useful for them, but it was also a better alternative than, say, the pressure of the socialists at that time. There was a socialist party that was demanding um, you know, municipal ownership, and they would do public re regulation instead. Um, so that, and then, and then they had various times kinds of money panics and concern. There was a real problem in 1909. So, but you, when you study a po policy organization, you can see the different strands then coming together, and then an opportunity that came with the uh, election of Wilson, uh, who had less hostages into the right wing. Obviously, the Republican of the business community had more of the moderate moderate uh, business community that were Democrats and Republicans, and then there was a possibility of making, culminating this progressive era and creating this set of reforms that then worked for them for a long, long time and, and dealt with their main problem of that time, which was uh, the socialists and a, and a disruptive labor force. And then, but, you know, By the way, the single best thing I know of on the New Deal period was a chapter that Bill wrote in his book, The Higher Circles, on the big, um, big business support for the, for the, for the Wagner Act 
and for the Social Security Act. Fascinating chapter. It's still almost up. Thank you. No, yeah. Thank you. I, I would like to it's raise amazing. a, a, a yeah. practical question for some people who might want to take some notes on this, and that is, are there some books about who governs, who rules California that people oh. might want to look at to get an idea so when they're like reading their newspaper, they know what to watch for, what kind of things they might want to clip and store up and that sort of thing. I will, I hate to be such a, sh yeah. a shill for Don Hoff here, no. but this book <laughs> actually is pretty good, especially uh -huh. if you can find the, the, in my opinion, the hardbound one, which you can maybe find in the, the used only, bookstores. You're very kind, Bill. The only trouble is that the, the data you see... doesn't make any more money on the used yeah. ones. Yeah. So. <laughs> no, but it's not in print. It's not in print. Right. So it's, but but it's, it's 1970 or 1972, right. and these things keep can, moving. But you can and, see uh, that's a real what problem. kinds of things to look for. How about there's that Chester Harmon book on the Yerba Buena project in San Francisco? Yeah. And that's an interesting book, and that does a lot of this stuff. And that was reviewed by Christine Dorfee in Libertarian Review. So, and she, I think, did a, quite a good job. Harmon is not a libertarian, and it, but it's, it's a very good book. It's got a lot of stuff in it, uh, and that's a, a good exploration of San Francisco in some respects. Also, also that Chester Harmon. Hartman. H-A-R-T-M-A-N. It's called Yerba Buena. I told you Bill and I went back a long way. Unfortunately, <laughs> that one's out of print, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Now, Isn't there something down the water, famous water stuff, in Los Angeles water? Yes, there's a new book by this guy. What's his name? Uh, something with a Chinatown K. picture. Yeah, but there's a new book. It's called Water book. Power. Yeah, the Water Power. Right? There's water a new power. book. Is it Car for its Carl? Carl is his name. K A K A R L. He is a he's a water geographer. He did the huge water map for the state of California. Anyway, he's done a huge book, a fat, fat book on the whole history of water politics in Southern yes. California. And I actually went to the American Historical Association panel on the book, and there's mm -hmm. some weaknesses here and there, as academics mm -hmm. always find. Yes. That's yes. your profession. But anyway, What's the name of it? I think it's called Water and Power or something, yeah. or Water Power, and K-A-R-L. Last name or first name? last name. I don't know any one good book on the state of California uh, or on power in the, this particular state and many of the things are excuse me are now out of date because they were done in a time right. of political ferment and there's yeah. less there's now. Less interest, less no, market. No Ramparts now. Magazine. Anymore. No yeah. Ramparts Magazine. Robert Felmuth did a book on land and power in California some years ago. He was a Nader's Raider and went through the data in great detail. But what I could do, what I, I think the only way I can respond really constructively to Bill's question, maybe go along it, beyond it in a certain way, is that there is a little book called Research for Action, and I put out by this California um, Rural Institute in Davis, and I cannot, I don't have the address with me, but what this person has done is a physicist who turned power structure researcher, and he's out for the facts, he's out for... He's often out for convictions. You know, you're out for politics. He says, I want policy, I want convictions, meaning he's looking for illegality. And he is a really a fine, fine expert on researching any power structure, looking up corporations, understanding relations to government. And in this pamphlet, he gives a number of examples of, a, for instance, a public hospital. Why was the local power structure so interested in this public hospital? Well, in the public hospital is this one little private part where they you know, do this fancy scan or operation, it turns out that the people that were the directors of the hospital were making a fortune, you know, through. <laughs> so he exposed that and helped them to organize politically in Woodland or some such near David. And I could, you could leave your, uh, if you were interested in, in this information, you could give me your um, name and address and I could mail you uh, the, a photocopy of the front page of that book just so you'd see what it was like and you could write to them it has the price on it and so on but it, it's the kind of thing that makes it possible then to understand what goes on in your particular town and since Bill mentioned urban renewal and your and local activity the main thing to understand about local activity in, a, in an American city is that it's that the whole game is around growth to, in, to improve land values a city in America is a growth machine. It is run by those who want to intensify land values. And then from there you go to figure out what their strategy is to intensify the use of their land. And in Santa Cruz it's to have more amusement and recreation because it's good beach property. In somewhere else, um, 
where you don't have such attractive land, then you bring in you know, smokestack kind of factories. And, and if you don't have anything at all, like Nevada, then you legalize gambling and prostitution and everything you can. Or if it's Atlantic City and you're going downhill, then you legalize the gambling. But you do, you have some strategy to maximize the value of your land. And the people that are involved in local government are intensively concerned about issues of water and zoning and planning, uh, street layouts, and so on. And, and this book explains how to research that kind of activity and, and to see just how they are realizing uh, the, these, these goals uh, through their involvement in city government. You might be, you might be lucky that some new left group still exists that cares about this stuff, you know? You might only just have crazy Marxist groups that they figured it all out. It's whoever... It's all capitalism. It's, it's all the property relations and we don't need to study any in particulars. Or you may have, you know, just conservative groups that say it's all the Jews or it's all the, you know, the scuzzy, poor scuzzy, scuzzy poor or whatever it is and they, they're not worried about the details either. But you might have some real groups out there that are interested in this. For example, if you live in the Bay Area, there's the, there's the Pacific Studies Center in, in Mountain View. And they have all these sorts of how to do it books. There's also the no-growth movement, which often does the same thing. In other words, keeping out poor people, keeping out apartment houses and that sort of stuff. And keeping, keeping out the subdivisions. So and that, can, the that can aid another oh, yeah. set of interests. Right, right. exactly. We have to leave here. They're having a wedding here. And uh, I appreciate it. Oh, you're holding up another panel. <laughs> no, I thought so too, but we're not. We're holding up uh, someone's uh, personal <laughs> celebration. So thank you all for coming. And thanks to the panel. Hi. My name's Ed Clark. Hi. I've read your speeches. I've got a son of a big business.